So thank you and good morning. Again, I'm Kirsten Schwartz and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biology and also the director of NKU's Ecological Stewardship Institute. So uh, if you're not familiar with the Ecological Stewardship Institute, what we do is bring folks together across campus to collaborate with community on issues of environmental importance. So I'm really happy to be able to share our current project that we're working on in Newport, Kentucky called Strategic Depaving. And there are two central themes to this project community engagement and transdisciplinarity. So I'll be focusing on those for this talk. So community engagement was really a focus of this project from the beginning. We interviewed folks in the neighborhood to see what are the biggest environmental concerns in your neighborhood. And so you can see the responses here, this word cloud, the words that are largest are the ones that were most often recorded. So people are, in Newport are concerned about water quality and green space. So from an environmental perspective, the most obvious way to put these two different ideas together, again, water quality and green space, is urban stormwater. So many are probably aware of the fact that when we have pavement or impervious surfaces, this intensifies stormwater. Right? Vegetation has an opposite effect. It slows down the water in the environment so that it can be absorbed and kept on the land and not make its way into our rivers and streams. This is a water quality issue. When we have stormwater runoff, this water makes its way again into our rivers and streams, especially problematic when we have combined sewer systems. Right, So when our runoff and our wastewater are combined, which is the case in our region, so in this area, there's approximately 11 and a half billion gallons of combined wastewater and stormwater that is discharged into our rivers and streams annually. So this is um, an environmental concern and also a public health concern. So with that in mind, we propose the, pro the project Strategic Depaving. The idea with this project is to remove impervious surfaces in the neighborhood and replace them with public green space. And we do that, propose to do that, through the use of community design charrettes, which you can see an example of here over on the right. Community design charrettes are very popular in the urban planning world. They're used to gather feedback from the community on projects. And uh, we propose to use that same model in this environmental project. So I mentioned it's a transdisciplinary project. We have folks from across campus that are involved in strategic depaving, from journalism uh, to biology, history, uh, arts, nursing. We have representatives from SINSAM and our Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement. Uh, but it's not the, the faculty, uh, but the undergraduate students that are really the stars of the show. We've had six undergraduate students engaged in the strategic depaving project so far. Uh, so starting at the top left and working clockwise, we have uh, Jada, who is a major in biology, Enrica, who's a major in English, Emily, who is electronic media and broadcasting, Taylor, bottom left, in fine arts, uh, Jackson from visual, visual communication and design, and Matt from uh, geography and journalism. So in addition to these students helping out with the community design charrettes, they are also working on their own independent projects related to this. So for example, uh, Jada is really interested in the idea of making green space design that is accessible even to those that suffer from allergies. So she's applying her knowledge of plant systems and biology to the plant selection for the design of this green space. Another example, Enrica is very interested in the history of the neighborhood community identity. Uh, how do we measure that and how can we incorporate that into, again, the design of public green space so that this is a place-based uh, project so that we bring that unique character. This is a public green space um, that is representative of the west side of Newport where we're working. 
So part of the project is building this interdisciplinary network across campus of faculty and students, but it's also building this collaborative network within the community. Right? So we have a lot of community partners that we've been working with. Our closest community partner is West Side Citizens Coalition, which is a neighborhood group in the West Side. Um, we've also worked with Re Newport and the city of Newport. This is a picture from some of the scholars participating in the Northern Kentucky Picnic Table Project. If you're familiar with that project, it was an opportunity for these students um, to network and get to know, again, our community partners. So in partnership with those community partners, specifically the West Side Citizens Coalition, we held our first community design charrette this summer. Um, so West Side Citizens Coalition was generous enough to let us take over their monthly meeting. Um, so this was held in the New Hope uh, Christian Center on Central Ave in the west side of Newport. And what we asked of participants are these questions. What is the kind of public green space that you'd like to see in your neighborhood? Where would you like to see public green space in your neighborhood? And how can that green space reflect you and your community? And we did that through a series of small group discussions that were facilitated by the ESI scholars. Uh, so Jada came up with this great icebreaker. We got to toss around this ball and answer some questions, get to know one another. Then we had some small group discussions that, again, the students led. What, is, what comes to mind when we say green space? How do you define that? What kind of parks do you visit and why? What kind of green space do you want to see in your neighborhood? What kind of amenities do you want to see in that green space? We had uh, a bunch of interactive activities as well. There's a map there of the neighborhood in which we're working where people could sticker or mark where they want to see green space in the community. So we have a very visual representation of those preferences. We had engagement for youth that attended the design charrette. So these felt boards uh, that the youth could use to design their ideal park. What would you want your park to look like? And then collaboratively design a park with their peers as well. After the first design charrette, we wanted to increase participation and feedback from the community. So we've done a series of smaller engagements. We participated in the Brighton Center community celebration as well as a tree planting in the west side. An important thing to note about these is that this is an iterative process, right? So the series of design charrettes continues to be refined, building on the knowledge that we've already gained. So for example, in that first community design charrette, we generate ideas of what's important to you, what do you want to see. We take the top answers, collate them, put these on the, the posters, allow people to come and then sticker vote out of these selections, what's your favorite, what's important to you. And again, this, this map of the neighborhood, where would you like to see green space in the neighborhood? So the next step after um, that is site selection, finding a site for us to actually work on. And we have found a site for our first um, depaving project in partnership with the city of Newport. Um, and that is a, a piece of property on the west side in the corner of 6th and Patterson. It is the site of the new Bernadette Watkins Park. Um, it has already been depaved, so all of the impervious surface has been removed um, by the city. So we are coming in at that phase of the project. Um, our community partners are very excited about this site. It has the potential to be the largest green space at the west side of Newport. So we're very excited that um, we can be a part of shaping the de design of this space. So our next community design charrette is Saturday, if you're available. It's from 11 to 1 on the site of the new Bernadette Watkins Park. Um, and again, it's in partnership with the city of Newport and also with our community partners, West Side Citizens Coalition and Re Newport. So this project is also about community engagement. We know that providing input to the community, seeking input from the community, and building these active and connected communities can support sustainable water practices and policies. What we're trying to answer with this project is, are they also more resilient? Right, so these community design charrettes are an opportunity for us and the community to learn about green infrastructure, to design that green infrastructure, and to build that green infrastructure. Right? It's also an opportunity for us 
to figure out if this long-term community engagement around green infrastructure builds agency and stewardship within the community. And does that lead to more resilient social ecological systems? So this is our conceptual framework. We have community engagement around the ecosystem services or the benefits that we get from vegetation. Does that build agency? Does that have the capacity to create and maintain desirable states? Being resilient doesn't mean bouncing back to the state that you were once at. It means bouncing back to a desirable state which may be different. And I think it does. I think it does matter. That's uh, why I'm doing this work. I think that the process of how we get to a greener west side matters. Not whether or not we get to a greener west side, what it looks like, that's all important, but it's the process of how we do it that is really crucial. And along those lines, how we engage communities matters, right? That's important. Um, and I wanted to spend a few minutes uh, talking to this point because NKU is a leader in community engagement, right? And because we are a leader in community engagement, we have a responsibility to improve the way in which we engage with communities, right? And strategic depaving, the Ecological Stewardship Institute, one of our goals is to contribute to this conversation on campus. How can we improve that process? So these are some best management practices that we found success with. Uh, I think it's very important to co-develop research questions, right? So develop those research questions with the community. This was our attempt with doing that survey as a first step, find out what is important to the community. Are you doing work that is uh, important to the community, that is impactful for the community in which you're working? I think it's important also to formalize the expectations between community and universities, right? So what is your obligation in the work that you're doing? Uh, what are you committing to? Uh, what are your expectations? I think all of that should be as clear as possible, whether that happens through a memorandum of understanding or community advisory boards. Community advisory boards, I think, have been gaining a lot of uh, traction lately, this idea that if you have research that you want to do in Newport, you bring that research to Newport and you have it reviewed um, by folks in the community to see if it's something that they would like to support. We need to address uneven power dynamics. There are uneven power dynamics that often um, occur in community university partnerships. Um, unfortunately, the academy at large has had a reputation of doing science in communities that can be exploitative, that can be extractive, um, and that's something that we not only need to acknowledge but actively address. And one way we can do that is to seek equitable funding models, right? If you are working in a community, you should bring, bring, be bringing resources and money uh, to that community as well and supporting the work in that way. And reducing barriers that academic structures, uh, because of the way we work, bring to community efforts. I think that's something that we should keep uh, in the front of our mind. So one of the ways that the Ecological Stewardship Institute is addressing that uh, is through um, funding that we are calling soil money. And so what does that mean? What is soil money? Uh, you're probably all very familiar with the concept of seed money. Right, to, to start initial research projects. And on the left, we see that uh, some seeds might thrive even if you don't prepare the soil, right? But you have a much better chance of those seeds thriving if you first do prepare the soil, right? And that's what we need to do with community university partnerships. It's about building relationship. The relationship building of community university partnerships is the most important aspect. It is undervalued and is underfunded, right? So this is um, a mechanism to hopefully start to address that. Uh, this is funded through AAAS and generous matching funds from NKU. It will fund a cohort of uh, six folks, three from NKU and three from the community that will meet informally over the year uh, to build relationships, to uh, build understanding, to build empathy, to try to find out points of uh, synergy between our university and the community in which we are embedded. And so I'll end with um, this from our, our recent commentary about soil money. 
Uh, constantly harvesting from your garden without providing resources to the soil is unsustainable. Likewise, we can't continue to reap the benefits of community university partnerships without investing in the process of cultivation. So I hope I'll, I'll end with a call for NKU to continue to invest in that relationship building like we have in the past and continue to invest in that cultivation. Um, I thank you for your time and for organizing this event today, the opportunity to share this work. I also wanted to recognize funding sources. This project is funded by NKU's Provost Office, the Signature and Emerging Research Area Competition, as well as Confluence. And again, recognize our community partners, Westside Citizen Coalition, the City of Newport, and Reed Newport. Thank you. The areas that we're targeting, um, we are hoping to work on, on public access to green space. So we've been working with the city and neighborhood foundations, which is essentially housing authority in Newport, um, to identify uh, vacant lots which are owned by them. This is how we first started the project. So there is a vacant lot inventory that was done. Uh, this area of the west side is the Buena Vista neighborhood. They've recently applied for historic district status, and as part of that process, they did a vacant lot inventory. Um, so that, that information was available to us at the start of the project, and that's where we started. So taking that data in terms of the vacant lots that are owned either by the city or neighborhood foundations, and comparing that to the feedback that we've gotten from folks that live there about where they want to see public green space. Sure, that's a great question. Um, so the work that we do, these design shreds and soliciting feedback, there's a, a lot of firms that you can hire to do that as well, right? So uh, for example, uh, Yard, if you've heard of them, is, is one in Bellevue. They were just at the Covington Farmer's Market this weekend. They had a big chalkboard and they were trying to get feedback on how did you get here? What did you buy? Uh, what did you want to do that you couldn't do, right? Same kinds of feedback that we're essentially getting when we're engaging with communities about green space, right? So when I went over and filled out my information on the chalkboard, I didn't also need to sign an informed consent form, right? Which is what someone would have to do if they're participating in our project. Uh, the folks that work in the IRB office here are phenomenal. Uh, the IRB process is important, right? But it is a structure of the academy that we bring with us doing this work in the community that others doing the same work don't bring. So that's one example, and I think that I had it up there because I think it's, um, I think it's our, our responsibility to think of ways that, that we can simplify that process so that this work can be more impactful. Right, uh, great question. I've worked in Newport for several years. The first research that I did in Newport was measuring soil lead, right? There's a historic lead smelter uh, in Newport, and because of that historic lead smelter and lots of other sources of lead that we see in many urban systems, there is elevated uh, lead in the soil in and around that neighborhood in Newport, in and around most of the neighborhoods of northern Kentucky and Cincinnati. So it's um, certainly a concern. Uh, environmental assessment um, is part of the process. Right? The site that we're working on um, has already undergone environmental assessment, not by us, uh, but the soil in that case was fill that was brought in. Um, so the city didn't anticipate that there would be any issues. But it's a very good point because uh, there are 
these industrial legacies, right? And there are the legacies that are in the biogeophysical realm, right? Soil lead is a good example. But there are also social legacies, right, in terms of place when you're working with the neighborhood. And doing this work really requires an understanding of both of those, recognizing that there are legacies within this physical environment as well as the social environment and structure as well. Okay, so now we launch into the part of our program where we call short spots. So these talks are a little bit um, shorter and faster, so we're going to move through quickly. Um, and so up, next up we have Michael Mannheimer, who is a professor in the Chase College of Law, who's going to talk to us about unusual punishment and the death penalty. And I don't know, Michael, were all those people outside the door waiting for you? There was like a whole crowd of people. I thought, wow, are those lost? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just going to go check, make sure there weren't people <laughs> Hey, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, as you can see, being from the law school, I have to have a different background than, than from everyone else. Um, so <clears throat> in the debate over the death penalty, uh, there's this issue lurking, this issue of federalism and states' rights. You know, the, it's, it's the, the application of the federal death penalty in non-death penalty states, and it's not an issue that people think about a lot. Um, but there are substantial federalism implications and uh, states' rights implications that I've thought a lot about and, and researched a lot about and written a lot about um, in the past few years. Um, <clears throat> and I've examined how the original understanding of the Eighth Amendment might, be, might bar uh, the use of the federal death penalty in non-death penalty states. So for today, in the brief amount of time that I have, I'd like to just accomplish a couple of things. First is, is, is to talk a little bit about the history of the federal death penalty in non-death non states, and then um, take sort of a normative turn um, and, and talk about my argument uh, as to why that might be unconstitutional. Um, so um, we see the non-death states here in blue. There are 20 non-death penalty states, 30 death penalty states. Uh, most recently, Washington State, as of last week, actually, the Washington Supreme Court declared their state death penalty law unconstitutional. Um, so federal death penalty prosecutions in non-death penalty states have been exceedingly rare. Uh, from the beginning of the republic, until 1993, it appears that only, so for about 200 years, it appears that there, there was only one uh, federal capital prosecution in a non-death state. And the unlucky outlier there was Anthony Chebatoris, who uh, he, uh, with an accomplice robbed a bank in Michigan in 1937. Uh, killed someone, uh, an innocent bystander along the way. His accomplice was also killed. He was uh, tried uh, and convicted and sentenced to death and executed in 1938 under the then new Federal um, uh, Bank Robbery Act. Um, so that's the only one. Uh, from 1993 to the present, however, um, the federal government has brought the death penalty, uh, brought death penalty prosecutions against 78 uh, people um, in non-death penalty states, uh, 20 during the Clinton administration, 39 during the George W. Bush administration, 10 during the Obama administration, and nine so far during the current administration. Uh, and notice those last two numbers, 10 during the eight years of the Obama administration, nine so far, almost as many in, in, in not even two years of the current administration. And in fact, all of those were, were brought in uh, this year, 2018. Uh, you'll see in the abstract, I said there were four. Since I submitted the abstract for this, 
there have been five more. Um, uh, and the, the, it's resulted in 11 uh, people having been sentenced to death under these circumstances. Um, for those of you who are not lawyers, which I suspect is most of you, the procedure for uh, bringing a death penalty prosecution is very different in the federal government than in the states. In the states, each local district attorney is essentially uh, you know, master of the realm and, and can decide whether to bring a death penalty prosecution. Um, in the federal government, it's very centralized. The local U.S. attorney will make a recommendation. That recommendation will go to what's called the Capital Review Committee, and they will make a recommendation. And then ultimately, the decision lies with the attorney general. So right now, Jeff, Jeff Sessions makes, makes the, the final call. Um, but there were changes to the death penalty protocol in, back in June of 2001 by John Ashcroft, who was newly uh, appointed attorney general, that made it more likely that death penalty prosecutions would be brought, federal death penalty prosecutions would be brought in non-death states. So um, it used to say that uh, the, the attorney general, I'm sorry, the local U.S. attorney had to uh, fill out an evaluation form and, and submit this to Maine Justice. Uh, if they indicted someone for a capital offense, local U.S. attorneys could get around that by indicting on federal offenses but on non-capital federal offenses, and they changed the language so the evaluation had to occur in any case where the person was charged with a capital offense or with conduct that could be charged as a capital offense. Um, the other big change um, is that, uh, you know, there are guidelines in place uh, to, for the federal prosecutors to decide when to bring a federal case. Um, the language um, used to say in, in these types of cases that the fact that a that the maximum federal death uh, that the maximum federal penalty is death, where the state's uh, maximum penalty is not, is insufficient standing alone to show a more substantial interest in federal prosecution. And what John Ashcroft did was that uh, take that right out of there. So the upshot is that there are more. Uh, it led the way to more um, uh, federal death penalty prosecutions against the recommendations of local U.S. attorneys. We never know what the local U.S. attorney recommends in those cases because that's confidential, but the word on the street uh, is that a lot of these are being brought against the recommendations of local U.S. attorneys. As you would imagine, local U.S. attorneys in, in Rhode Island or Massachusetts or Vermont might not want to bring death penalty prosecutions, in part because they know they might, you know, it's pretty rare to get a, a uh, a death sentence in those places. Um, <clears throat> let me briefly talk about how this plays out in a particular case. There's a case pending in the Central District of Illinois uh, called Brent Christensen, U.S. versus Brent Christensen. Christensen is accused of kidnapping, raping, and killing a young woman who was a grad student at the University of Illinois. He lured her from a bus stop into her car, and he's charged with murder in relation to a federal kidnapping. You might ask, how is this a federal kidnapping? It all took place in Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. He never crossed state lines. Uh, and before 2006, you would be correct. Uh, it wouldn't be a federal kidnapping. But in 2006, they added this language that said if the offender um, uses any means, facility, or instrumentality of interstate commerce in committing the offense, that's now a federal kidnapping. So, so most kidnappings now, I would say, are probably federal Kidnapping, because what was the means or instrumentality of interstate commerce that Christensen used? The indictment tells us his cell phone, because the you know the 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 waves or however that works, you know, cross state lines, um, and his car, uh, because cars have been deemed by some courts at least to be instrumentalities of interstate commerce. Um, so we see um, in these uh, uh, cases, you know, a troubling tendency of the federal government to pull cases like this. Into federal court, Illinois doesn't have the death penalty. Uh, most murder prosecutions are at the state level, but Illinois doesn't have the death penalty, so the federal government pulls this into state court in order to get the death penalty. Uh, so let me spend the last few minutes talking on, about the normative claim that I make uh, and about the cruel and unusual punishments clause. My claim, uh, stated briefly, is that the words cruel and unusual in the Eighth Amendment calibrate the limits on federal punishment to the punishment practices of each individual state. So a federal punishment is cruel and unusual if it's unauthorized by the law of the state where the crime occurred. Um, to understand why I make that argument, we have to understand why we have a Bill of Rights. Now, most people, in fact, most lawyers would probably say we have a Bill of Rights to protect our individual rights, and that's um, only partly right. We, we have a Bill of Rights to protect our individual rights from the federal government. We have to remember that for 77 years, 
from 1791 to 1868, the Bill of Rights applied only to the federal government. Um, the 14th Amendment, enacted after the Civil War, uh, incorporates the Bill of Rights and applies it against the states. That process took about 100 years for the courts to determine that the Bill of Rights also protects us against the states. So within the lifetimes of many people in this room, from about the mid to late 60s, um, we can speak of the Bill of Rights applying to the states. But the Bill of Rights technically applies only to the federal government. Um, so why do we have the Bill of Rights? The, the, the anti-federalists um, who were opposed to the Constitution um, demanded that uh, a Bill of Rights be enacted in order to sort of placate their fears. The Federalists favored the Constitution. Anti-Federalists were opposed to the Constitution. They were opposed to the Constitution because they felt it gave the federal government too much power, um, and it also uh, didn't guarantee for individual rights. We tend to think of those as two separate things. In fact, over at the law school, when we teach constitutional law, first semester we talk about power and structure, and the second semester we talk about rights. But that's not how they viewed things, at least that's not how the anti-federalists viewed things back in, in, in the late 1780s, early 1790s. They viewed the preservation of state power as inextricably intertwined with the preservation of individual rights. So the states were seen as the guarantors of rights. Um, uh, so they demanded a Bill of Rights that was um, designed to protect individual rights um, by uh, essentially calibrating federal rights to state law. And they did this through phrases like due process of law, unreasonable searches and seizures, and yes, cruel and unusual punishments with, with this phrase, the framers uh, and ratifiers recognize there are few issues more truly local than uh, the issue of criminal punishment. Um, crimes are offenses against the community, and it should be the citizenry of the local communities and the states to set the outer bounds of uh, punishment. So it makes some sense to read the word unusual in the Eighth Amendment as calibrating the constraints on the federal government to the constraints that the states placed on themselves. Um, so if the citizens of a state do not authorize capital punishment, um, then the infliction of capital punishment within that state is cruel and unusual punishment. And let me spend the last minute, I know I'm a little bit over, um, by, by saying don't take my word for it, as they say. Um, we have an important instance of the use of the term cruel and unusual during that time period um, in which it was used in exactly that way. Uh, in 1783, under the Articles of Confederation, the Confederation Congress wanted to pass an impost resolution uh, placing uh, customs duties on molasses and rum and, and so forth. And as you might know, under the Articles of Confederation, for Congress to do anything, it required the assent of all 13 states. All 13 states eventually did ratify this impost resolution, but four of the 13 states, importantly, when they ratified the impost resolution, they did it only on condition that the Confederal government be forbidden, from, be forbidden from punishing people for customs violations in a way that exceeded state law. And the way that they did it, here's a, a, the New Hampshire um, uh, ratification. They said, you, uh, you can't impose uh, punishments which are either cruel or unusual in this state. And you see the same exact wording or similar wording in, in Massachusetts, uh, cruel or unusual in this commonwealth. In, uh, in, in, in South Carolina, the same thing, and in Georgia, the same thing. Um, so I, my position at the end of the day uh, on the, is agnostic on the death penalty. I think people can reasonably disagree on the utility and the justness and uh, the propriety of the death penalty. They have for centuries, if not millennia. Um, but the fora for that disagreement should be in the state legislatures, the legislatures of the 50 states where the representatives of the people can hash things out. Um, and in these cases where the federal government is bringing death cases in non-death states, they are transgressing the authority given to the people, the citizens of the state, to determine whether capital punishment will be uh, allowed within the state borders. Thank you. I'll be happy to take, I you know, I'll be happy to take questions, like my students, I'll be happy to take questions during lunch, so come up to me and, and just start talking.
So next up, we have Joe Mester, who's going to, from the biology, biological sciences department, who is going to talk to us about vaccines for hepatitis C. Isn't that great, the diversity of talks that we have? We're going from the death penalty to vaccines for hepatitis C. Very cool. <laughs> Doesn't show up very well on the wall, though. Ah, uh, the train set. Yes. Would you like a lavalier, or are you okay with podium mic? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind walking. I guess. Wake me up. Just hot flip that on, and then turn it on on the top there, and you. All right. Yeah. Let me just carry this. <laughs> Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Mester. I'm gorgeous. Um, I'm in the Department of uh, Biology here, and uh, this is one of our seven labs in the Canadian laboratory. Uh, this one started as a collaborative project, so uh, we had to uh, move the program for uh, some reasons. Uh, one of them is uh, being interested in changing the environment to work on our Answer. Better? Hello? Ah, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, the project is focused on developing a safe and effective vaccine for hepatitis C. Uh, hepatitis C virus, I'm sure you've all heard about it. Um, there are millions infected in the United States, hundreds of millions worldwide. And it's not just a come and go infection. It's an infection for life. So people carry the virus uh, essentially for their, their whole lives, uh, a lot of times without any symptoms until uh, the liver starts to fail. And that could be 10 years, it could be 20 years, uh, maybe 30. Uh, so the, the development time frame is, is variable, but the end stage is usually the same. Uh, it's a liver disease characterized by cirrhosis, so uh, fibrotic lesions and um, uh, non-function of the liver, or carcinoma that can then spread to other parts of the body. So particularly in northern Kentucky, or Kentucky in general, uh, we lead the nation in uh, the incidence of new hep C infections. And we're actually an epicenter, uh, as well as Appalachia, for uh, the spread of hep C. So the CDC estimates uh, over the past 10 or so years about 100 or two um, documented infections uh, every year. Uh, but then they add a caveat that we're probably missing a lot more. So if you multiply that by about 14, um, they, they expect uh, undocumented cases to total probably thousands per year. Uh, again, because most people don't know that they're infected and they don't have symptoms right away until the later stages. So uh, NKU is right in kind of the middle of this. So how do you stop Hep C? Well, uh, there's no vaccine. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a vaccine guy, so that's where uh, I would like to, uh, you know, prevent the virus. Uh, for now, uh, the precautions are safe sex, and uh, don't share your needles or snort straws. So I don't know how many people <laughs> subscribe to all of these, but um, that's, that's really what we have uh, for now. Um, as far as developing a vaccine, so the, the virus is shown, I don't think this is going to work, on, the, on the your right-hand side. Uh, it's a, a simple structure. It's really a shell composed of three proteins, a core protein and, and uh, two envelope proteins. Uh, it's got an RNA genome inside and several proteins that are shown in blue uh, on the bar chart that are made in infected cells. So what we're targeting with the vaccine are, are the structural proteins, the core and two envelope proteins. Uh, they form the structure of the virus, and uh, that is really, I think, a good target for the immune system to, uh, to focus in on to prevent uh, new infections. So our goal is to design a vaccine um, that mimics actual infection in the body. 
A lot of uh, vaccines are produced outside of the body, like flu, hep B, uh, papillomavirus, and then they're injected into the body. And that's okay for uh, producing one part of the immune response, the antibody side, but it really doesn't engage T cells. T cells need to see um, viral proteins produced within the body, and that really activates them. And, and T cells are really critical to protect against viral infections. So we're trying to design a vaccine that mimics infection, but it's still safe. So it's going to produce the uh, viral proteins within the body itself, not outside. Uh, and, and as a gauge of success, I want to look at both the long-lived uh, T cell response, memory T cells, as well as uh, B cells and antibodies. So if the vaccine can make those, presumably uh, when the person is, if they're ever exposed to the wild type virus, um, they'll be protected. Um, the T cells and antibodies will shut down the virus. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, essentially, this um, vaccine is a DNA-based vaccine. We're trying to get the instructions to make the vaccine into the host's, host cells so that they produce the viral proteins, just like in an infection, but in a safe way, and then uh, mount the immune response, mount that protective uh, long-term immune response. So uh, it's a, uh, a vaccine that we can grow because it's DNA-based in E. coli, so manufacturing is always an issue. So we can make lots and lots of this protein, or lots and lots of this DNA-based vaccine. And then we transfer it, though, to make it more effective at getting into the host's cells. We package it in another virus. We, we, we package it in a delivery virus uh, that you may have heard of, herpes simplex virus. So this is the cold sore virus, and this is actually one of the most well-studied viruses uh, on the planet. It's been studied for about 50 years in, in a lot of detail. So we know a lot about its genetics, we know how to manipulate it, and we know how it gets around, and it does get around. So uh, we, we think it's a, a very effective tool for uh, bringing in DNA to host cells. Hep C is definitely more of a challenge. It doesn't really grow outside the body. So to actually get the genes for Hep C to build into the DNA, we had to, to make them synthetically. So we found a sequence that a Japanese group published online. We sent that to a gene shop in Germany, and they actually built well, a third of the genome. So it's very easy nowadays to build viral genomes, uh, sometimes easier than just trying to, to splice them out of the virus themselves. Uh, so um, our actual vaccine is um, three different DNA segments. It includes bacterial DNA, so the DNA will grow in bacteria. It includes that herpes vector, so it can be packaged as a uh, herpes particle to deliver the DNA, and it actually has the hep C uh, genes in it to instruct cells to make the hep C proteins. Pretty cool stuff. So what do we do with it? So we first tested it in uh, a variety of different human cells to see, oh, three minutes, oh, no, <laughs> to see if it was able to produce protein. So we, it does express at the RNA level. We're, we're still looking at the protein level, and we're hoping that it does make those shells of the virus that look like virus, but they're really not, that that would be the best thing for the immune system. And a lot of the work that we've focused on to date is focused on a really key immune cell called the dendritic cell, and these are key at generating long-lived uh, T and B cell responses. So we focused a lot on how the vaccines interact with um, immune cells, dendritic cells, from a variety of different donors that uh, we got from Hawksworth. And we found that, uh, just to, to summarize things in 10 seconds, that uh, it's really, really effective at activating everything you, you would uh, think you need to uh, engender a good, uh, strong immune response. So uh, it, the vaccine exposure upregulates the cell surface markers. You get a, a burst of inflammatory um, cytokines that would activate the immune system. And you get chemokines, too, that pull in T and B cells to the side of, of the vaccine presentation um, that would activate them. So you need all of these things for a good, strong immune response. Here we're showing just one result, a T cell uh, chemokine called Rantes, but we've looked at hundreds, if not thousands of these to make sure that um, at the molecular level it looks like it's, it's doing what we want it to. For vaccines, you always also test in mice or in an animal model, and there you're looking, does it work and generate uh, antibodies in T cells? So we use for antibodies a cutoff of 10 micrograms per mil in serum. That's the protective level for the Hep B vaccine. You can see different formulations of the vaccine actually easily surpassed what we think it will be a protective amount of antibody. We also check T cells. We get a nice uh, production of interferon gamma from um, the vaccine group B, uh, showing that when they're exposed to the core protein, we're kind of re-exposed to what looks like the virus. 
uh, we think gamma interferon is a really strong protective cytokine against hep C infections. So it looks good at both the antibody and T cell level in, in the mouse model. One more. Two steps forward. There we go. <laughs> so, uh, in summary, we uh, we have a novel delivery uh, system. Nobody else really has this uh, herpes virus delivery system. So we're excited about it. We think it's a, a safe and effective way of bringing these vaccine DNAs into cells. Um, we've shown that it's immunogenic in both a human cell culture model and in animal models with pivotal pivotal cells and responses. And uh, after Hep C, you know, we're hoping to publish this data for Hep C, get other folks interested to see if they think it's a valid way of moving forward to protect everyone. Um, but it, it's a really versatile system, so we think we could actually, in, with the DNA-based nature, uh, put in a whole series of genes from, say, all bloodborne pathogens like HIV, Hep B, Hep C, and so on, or even do one for um, mosquito vectored um, uh, diseases such as West Nile, dengue, um, uh, Zika, and so on. So it's a very versatile platform. Okay, and thanks you again to uh, Sam for, for setting up this symposium. I wish I had a few more minutes, but maybe next year. <laughs> um, uh, Sue for providing funding, our, our dean and chair for uh, their assistance along the way. Um, uh, this grant is funded now uh, by a, a, a grant from Carol Schwartz through the College of Arts and Science, so thanks to Carol. Uh, lots of students have worked on this since we built the first ones in 2014. Uh, both in the individual research lab and also in teaching labs and immunology lab, which is coming up again this spring. Um, Louisville did a, a folks there in the informatics group uh, helped us look at our uh, dendritic cell expression profiles. Uh, Hawksworth uh, Blood Center is a great collaborator. Uh, we've gotten blood from, I think, 20 different donors now, healthy donors, not hep C infected, but just to see how healthy uh, human cells would respond to the vaccine. And uh, these vaccines were built at the University of Pittsburgh in the Goins and Glorioso lab. The technology, that, that core kind of viral uh, build of the DNA was designed by uh, Yoshitaki, uh, Yoshitaka Miyagawa, who's now uh, at the Nippon Medical School in Tokyo. Okay, sorry if I went over. <laughs> Thank you, any questions? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there, there's a very exciting development in the last year or two. They, they found two drugs that in combination are actually cure someone infected from hepatitis C. So they noticed when they were using one of the drugs is used in HIV uh, in, for HIV treatment, and they noticed in treating HIV, they also knocked out hep C. So it's a very exciting development. The issue has been that it's very expensive. It's about a 12-week course of treatment. They, the uh, uh, drug company is charging about $1,000 a pill, so it costs about $100,000 to cure hep C. It's still cheaper than a liver transplant, which is about $400,000, and a lot of times the insurance companies aren't approving it until the liver is failing. So, so a vaccine is usually much more cost-effective, but there, there is good news, there is a cure. It's just expensive. <laughs> Right, right, and it's disabled, so it's really just a carrier virus, and it's one that we know can get into all cell types. And it can be modified to, to target it specifically to certain cell types. So, but it is defective, it can't grow on its own, so there's a special cell line that we grow it in, but then when it gets in the body, it's really just a shuttle. It's just a way to get more DNA into the cells of the body to make more hep C proteins. The DNA, yeah, and, and the good thing about herpes DNA is it naturally gets into cells and establishes a stable um, residence, I guess, in the nucleus. So it's meant to, actually, it's designed to sit in cells for the life of the host. So it's, it's a really good shuttle, it's, it's really good at getting into cells, and then it actually keeps the DNA stable in the nucleus for as long as the cell lives. So just a few um, housekeeping items. We have one more speaker before lunch. He, he is all that stands between you and lunch, Nathan. Um, 
So just as a reminder, lunch is over in the University Center Ballroom. Okay, don't go to the Student Union Ballroom. It's in the University Center Ballroom. Um, please join us, and Mark Wasisco will be giving um, a, a talk during lunch on, um, let me make sure I get it right, You Make Me Smile. So I think that's going to be fun. Um, and then back here at 1 o'clock in the Digitorium, we have two more short spot speakers before we break into our panels. So please join us for lunch. Please come back at 1 o'clock for our, our two remaining short spot speakers and join us for the afternoon in the reception as well and the presentation of our first Saul Award. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nathan D. Lee, who is with the Department of Physics, Geology, and Engineering Technology, who's going to talk to us about the stars. All right, can you hear me? Ah, yeah, good, it's working. All right, so uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that I've been working with uh, one of my undergraduate students, uh, Kyle Houston, on. Uh, this is part of an NSF-funded grant. And uh, what we're trying to look at is how stars dance through the sky. So this work is built upon a large collaboration. Here's just some of the people who have contributed to this. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge them. So we often think about a star just sitting in space by itself. But the reality is, is that most stars have friends. Now, some of those friends are the same size as the star. So imagine you have something like the sun. Let's see if I can, uh, no. OK, so we have the sun there. And the sun, uh, actually, in most cases, stars like the sun have a companion of very similar size. So you can have two stars that are exactly the same size going around each other. The nearest star system to us, Alpha Centauri, is actually three stars that all dance around each other. You can also get things called red dwarfs, which are smaller stars. Uh, and below that, you have brown dwarfs, which are kind of intermediate between stars and planets. And then, of course, planets like our own, which travel around the sun. OK, well, that's great. We have these little dances going on. But why do we care right, on some level? How does it mean anything to us? Well, the reason it's important to us is that we have the big question in astronomy, which is, are we alone in the universe, right? Are humans the only intelligent creatures that exist at all? And to be able to answer that question, we have to be able to figure out how many planets there are like Earth throughout our galaxy and the rest of the universe. And the way we figure that out is by coming up with a modern theory of star and planet formation. So we've got a couple of different possibilities here. Whoa, let's come back, there we are. Uh, we have a couple of different possibilities that are kind of based upon our own solar system. But in the last 20 years, we found about 4,000 to 5,000 new solar systems that are not our own. And so we have to be able to describe them. So how do we, how do we deal with this? Well, first we need to create a catalog of known companions uh, in our astronomical surveys. And then we can use that catalog to compare different new models and compare old models and try to come up with a complex theory about how planets and stars are formed. OK, well, how do we create such a catalog? Well, the main way you do it is by looking at a whole mess of stars. right? And we do this, in my case, using a survey called the Apogee Survey. So the Apogee survey was a survey of about 146,000 stars. And the mission of this survey was to map out the shape of the Milky Way galaxy, our home galaxy. As a side effect of this mapping process, a few of the stars got hit more than once. We took more than one picture of them. About 14,000 uh, stars got that. And it's these stars that we can use to figure out how individual stars are moving around each other. OK, so here's an example of the situation that we have. We have something like the sun in the center, and then we have an unseen planet, right? The star is much, much brighter than the companion. So all you can see is the star itself. And so what we do is we map how that star is moved. It's wobbled by its companion. It's as if I was dancing here with someone else, and you couldn't see them. But by looking at my motions, 
you can figure out what the other person's doing. And so that's exactly how uh, you know, we do it in this sort of work. And so we end up with plots that are velocity on the y-axis and then uh, time over period, which is sometimes called phase, on the x-axis. Now, when we look at these dances, we don't get to see the full movie. Instead, we see snapshots here and there taken randomly amongst many cycles of the dance. It's almost like you have a Gene Kelly film, right, where someone's gone in and cut everything up and just thrown a few frames onto the ground. And then you have to somehow rearrange everything so that's in the correct order. So here's an example of observations taken over uh, two years or so of the same stellar system. And it looks kind of like gobbledygook, right? There's nothing there. What we need is a way to go from these glimpses to the actual dance, right? Here is the same data, but where we know the key parameter, which is the orbital period, how long one individual dance takes. Once you know that, you can put each of the frames back into the correct order. So our goal is to figure out what method is the best, best method for taking glimpses and turning them into dances. So how do we test our different uh, methods? Well, we need to create a few dances of our own that don't come uh, from the sky. So we create a mock catalog of stars that we know the answer to what their dance should look like, what their orbit should look like. And by using this mock catalog, we're able to test out our different techniques and see how well they work. That's pretty straightforward on some level. So we had two methods. We had one called the lohm scargill method and one called the fast chi-squared method. In the lohm scargill method, we make the very simple assumption that all orbits look like sine waves. And you can see that in the orange there. The actual data is in blue points. And you can see that the sine wave doesn't fit the blue points very well, right? But it's simple and robust. The other method, fast chi-squared, adds on extra terms in the Fourier series, if that is meaningful to you. It adds on extra harmonics. It allows it to wiggle a little bit more. And you see that the fast chi-squared in the green is able to go through the points very well. Okay. So we've got these two methods. There is a little bit of problem with extra fanciness. The fast chi-squared sometimes finds things that are not very good at all. You can see here on the left, it goes, oh, yeah, that looks like the orbit. I've reassembled it correctly. I understand he jumps back and forth in the film, but, uh, you know, I think this might be right. Or in the uh, right, you see where we found the right period, but wrong by factor of three. We call this an alias, right? So it's correct, just off by uh, a whole number uh, factor. So, again, that's kind of an issue. Again, the real data is in blue, uh, and you see the sine wave, again, fits that pretty well. All right, so what's the result of, of what we've done? Um, here is uh, one of the trials we did. On the x-axis, we have the true period of the system. Right, again, the orbital period, how long it takes to go around once. And on the y-axis, we have the period that our algorithm found. And you see, uh, in the case of loam scargill we have a pretty nice one-to-one -one relation. Right, we actually do a pretty good job uh, finding, uh, finding orbits. However, uh, we do have a few points, especially on the large orbital period side, that just go haywire. And so we're like, well, this is good, but can we do better? And the answer is uh, maybe fast chi-squared will let us do this. Well, not so much. Right? It turns out the extra complexity introduces in all sorts of weird behaviors. Right? So you again see the one-to-one -one line in the blue, but you also see alias lines, a factor of two and a factor of three, living as straight lines above uh, that. And you also see a certain amount of just weirdness, both at the low and the high end. And it's, it's coming from exactly what we were seeing before, that it's fitting shapes that are not correct, because it does not know what an orbit should look like. It just goes, eh, that seems reasonable. And uh, so that's not great. All right. So where are we going to go from here? We're going to try uh, in our future runs to limit the complexity that a fast chi squared is able to use. Try to find some middle ground between Lohm-Scargill and fast chi squared. 
right? Something that is a little more complex, but not so complex that it gets lost. Another route that we've been exploring recently is using uh, techniques that are based upon uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. In this case, we actually use actual orbits. We know what a Keplerian orbit looks like. We know how planets should go around each other because we understand gravity. And this technique is very good. It finds the right answer. But whereas Loam Scargill and Pascal Squared can finish within a few minutes, Markov chain Monte Carlo can take half an hour to an hour to run. And so the time ends up killing you when you're trying to do 14,000 stars. So we're going to go back and forth on these things, see if we can find some sort of intermediate route, maybe a combination, maybe take a first pass with Loam Scargill and then give those first pass answers to the Monte Carlo to let it go faster. Uh, in any case, this is uh, where we're heading. And uh, thank you very much uh, for spending some time with me. Uh, any questions? So uh, certainly we can, if we are looking at stars in the Milky Way, right, uh, we know something about uh, like the chemical composition of these stars, which greatly controls how the initial protoplanetary disk that forms the planets uh, is made, right? If you have more heavy metals like iron and rock, you make things that are more like the Earth, and you have more water type things, you end up with things like uh, Jupiters. And so by looking at different regions of the Milky Way that have different chemical compositions, we can then say, ah, this chemical composition gives this number of planets. You can then go to a nearby galaxy and say, ah, that galaxy has this chemical composition. Maybe we can figure out what the planets are using the Milky Way as a model. But in general, we'll have to use the Milky Way as a model because there's no way to see these uh, motions at those great distances. We're really limited to nearby stars. Yes, so all of the systems that we are trying out right now are just binary systems, so two, two dancers. Right? If you throw a third dancer in, then everything becomes much more complex. You can do it. Uh, basically, what you do is you find the first dance, put that in order, then you subtract that off of the data and look for other dances. And that works OK, but it ends up, uh, in general, it's much more complex, and errors in your uh, measurements end up creating false signals uh, more often than you'd like. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's usually, it's, it's best when the orbital periods of uh, like a three system uh, or three star system are substantially different. So let's say you have an inner pair that's rotating around each other at, with a two day or four day orbit, and then you have an outer pair or outer star that's going around on a 100 or 200 day orbit. Then it's easy to separate because one dances, you know, go from full fast and one's going very slow and it's easy to separate the two. It's not some complexity, but if you have, you know, one pair that's going at four days, another going at eight, right, then it's hard to know who's causing which wiggle and that becomes much more problematic. 